Okay, so we're looking here at a function we've looked at before, and we did some work already with this function with the first derivative. Um, but this question asks us some different things about this. So it asks us to find points of inflection and intervals on which this function is concave up and concave down. All right, so all of that stuff is information that is going to come from the second derivative. I have the original function. I found some information about the original function. I thought about the domain. I found a point at the origin. I thought about limits so that I could describe end behavior of this function. I found some things from the first derivative. I found critical points where I set this first derivative equal to zero and solved for x. And we got x equals negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. And those are critical points. And then we did a little sign chart where we put those critical points on the number line. And, and we determined where the function was increasing and decreasing. And that told us about whether these points were local maximum or location of local minimum. All right, so we're going to be doing this information that it asks us here about the second derivative. But essentially, we're going to be doing the same process that we did with the first derivative. We're going to be looking at where the second derivative is 0 or does not exist. We'll solve for x, and we'll look at a sign chart, and that will help us answer the question. That sign chart is not going to tell us about increasing and decreasing. It's going to tell us about concave up and concave down. But essentially, the process is the same process. OK, so first of all, I need the second derivative. I'll do that over here, f double prime of x. And I'm going to be taking the derivative of this. All right, so I'm going to need a little product rule and a little chain rule and a little simplifying. So you might pause this video, try taking that derivative and simplifying it, and see if you get the same thing that I get here. I'm going to write down the simplified version of this second derivative after you've already done a little bit of algebra. All right, so what you should get for the simplified version of the second derivative is 2e to the 2x times the quantity 2x squared plus 6x plus 3. All right, so after you've found that second derivative and done a little simplifying, this is what you get. All right, but from there, we're basically going to be doing the same process that we did before, where we're going to look at where that second derivative does not exist, any points where that does not exist but are in the domain of the original function. We have none of those here. And where that second derivative is equal to 0. OK, so I'm going to set the second derivative equal to 0 and solve for x. OK, so when I have this second derivative equal to 0, similar to what we did when we had our first derivative equal to 0, it's in factored form. So that means that the only way I get 0 when I multiply two things is if one or the other of these two factors is 0. So either 2e to the 2x is equal to 0, or this expression is equal to 0. e to any power is never 0. So that doesn't happen in this one. So the only critical the these are hypercritical points, actually, that I get from the second derivative. The only hypercritical points that I'll get will come from this second derivative equal to 0. So again, I'm going to use quadratic formula. Okay, using quadratic formula, 36 minus 24 is 12. Square root of 12 can be simplified to 2 square root of 3. And then I can go ahead and simplify this a little bit more. Uh, I'm, I tend to like to separate these and reduce each fraction. So negative 6 over 4 would be negative 3 halves. And then I have plus or minus 2 square root of 3 over 4 will reduce 2 square root of 3 over 2. All right, so just like I did before where I made a sign chart and I looked at the signs of my first derivative to tell whether my function was increasing or decreasing and where my extrema were, I'm going to do the same thing with my second derivative and a sign chart with these values on it. All right, so I'm going to go over here and make a number line. I'm going to put them in order, how they would be on a number line. So negative 3 halves minus square root of 3 over 2 is going to be left. And then negative 3 halves plus square root of 3 over 2. 
Decimal approximations will be helpful here. If you can't tell which one's bigger or smaller, you might be able to just think about that with the negatives. I'm going to plug values in either region. Something left of negative 3 halves minus square root of 3 over 2. Something between these values and something right of negative 3 halves plus 3 square root of 2 into my second derivative. And I don't really care so much exactly about the numerical value of that second derivative there. I just really care about whether that's going to be positive or negative. This expression here in the front will always be positive. So really, the only thing that's going to change signs is this quadratic expression, 2x squared plus 6x plus 3. OK, so when I plug those values in, I should get that my second derivative is positive when I am left of negative 3 minus square root of 3 over 2. My second derivative is negative when I'm between these two values. And my second derivative is positive when I am right of negative 3 halves plus square root of 3 over 2. All right, so that tells us about our concavity, and it also tells us about our points of inflection. So when my second derivative is positive, the graph is concave up. When the second derivative is negative, the graph is concave down. Second derivative is positive, the graph is concave up. I like these little happy and sad faces just to kind of help me remember about that. Second derivative positive, concave up. Negative, concave down. Positive, concave up. All right, so I can answer my questions here by using this sign chart. Our textbook organizes this information a little bit differently, but it's the same idea that you're looking for here. So uh, I can answer my questions here about uh, the intervals on which the function is concave up and concave down, and my question about inflection points as well. Okay, so using what I have over here in the sign chart, I'm going to put my answer right here. So, uh, let's see, for this problem we said that the function, the original function, is concave up on two different intervals here. Uh, when I am left of negative 3 halves minus square root of 3 over 2, and also when I am right of negative 3 halves plus square root of 3 over 2. Okay, concave up on that interval. And then when we are between these two values, our function is concave down. Okay, so there is my answer for the question about concavity, uh, where the function is concave up and where it is concave down. And then I actually already have an answer here for my inflection points as well. An inflection point is a place where the graph changes concavity. So I have inflection points here at these two x values. These are the x coordinates of my inflection points. If I want y coordinates of those inflection points, I can plug them into the original function and get y coordinates of them. I'm just going to state the x coordinates of those inflection points. So I have inflection points. I'll just put that over here. Inflection points. at both of these two x values, it changes concavity there. Okay, so two inflection points and two changes in concavity here. All right, so we're going to look again at the graph on the graphing calculator, and you'll notice when you look at that that it's difficult to see these changes in concavity. So it's important that you understand you can use what you know here to help you zoom in near these points and get a little bit better picture I were going to sketch this picture, here's what my sketch would look like. So I have a graph that's concave up until we get to this x-coordinate, and then the graph is concave down until I get to the next x-coordinate, and then the graph is concave up again. So I've got these changes in concavity. We already did some work with increasing and decreasing. We know we have a local minimum and a local maximum. We also did some work with end behavior. So this is a picture of the graph that shows all the changes in concavity and the increasing and decreasing. You might use your calculator to get some nice coordinates of these points here. Uh, we've got them in exact form here, but you can get decimal approximations. Let's look at the graph on the calculator and notice that when you look at the graph on the calculator, uh, you can see this part really well, but all of this hidden behavior that's over here, I wouldn't have even known that was there if I hadn't done this calculus work to find out about it. So if you see that on your calculator, great. 
but I can usually tell when students have relied too heavily on their calculator because that kind of picture is what they draw and that kind of picture is how they answer their questions. So make sure that you're doing your calculus and then using your calculator to make sure it's correct. Zoom in where you need to zoom in until you see a picture that looks like what you expect it to look like based on your calculus work.